Welcome to the Lean Blog Podcast. Visit our website at www.leanblog.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Graben. Hi, this is Mark Graben. Welcome to episode 290 of the podcast. It's October 16th, 2017. Joining me today is a three-time guest now, Eric Reese. When we first talked in episode 115 six years ago, his New York Times bestselling book, The Lean Startup, was being published. In 2012, we discussed the impact of Toyota's Taiichi Ono on his work. That was episode 142. And this time we're talking about his new book, The Startup Way. So in this episode, Eric talks about how lean startup concepts came from lean production and the Toyota production system and how Toyota then approached him about applying lean startup concepts in the development of a new in-dash electronic system. In recent years, GE and other large companies in their efforts to be more innovative and entrepreneurial, have adapted these uh, approaches into what Eric now calls the startup way. Will modern companies embrace a formal entrepreneurship function as they earlier embraced finance and marketing? We'll discuss that and a lot more. So if you go to the post for this episode at leanblog.org slash 290, you'll find links to Eric's books, uh, our previous podcasts, There's also a seven-page PDF summary and a complete transcript. His book, The Startup Way, is set for release tomorrow on October 17th. I had a chance to read the book in advance and enjoyed it very much. You can also learn more about uh, the book at the official website, www.thestartupway.co. I hope you'll also join me and Eric, of course, and many others at the annual Lean Startup Week event where I will be a speaker and session facilitator. You can learn more about that by going to leanstartup.co. Eric, hi. Welcome back to the podcast. Thanks uh, so much for joining us again. Oh, it's terrific to be back. So, you know, there's a, well, a lot to catch up on. You've got a, a new book. You know, when we talked um, uh, first off, you know, six years ago, The Lean Startup was coming out and you've been doing a lot of uh, work since then. And, you know, a lot of my yeah. listeners work for large companies, uh, health systems. So I was wondering you know, if you could talk about how um, you know, ideas from the lean startup uh, you know, started to become introduced into uh, bigger companies as you, um, as you cover in the new book, the, uh, the startup way. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I remember those interviews uh, fondly and, What's been really interesting, so if you go back in time to 2011 when when the Lean Startup came out, I had written in that book that um, the best way to think about entrepreneurship was as a management discipline because my definition of a startup was was the following. It was a human institution designed to create something new under conditions of extreme uncertainty. So I had kind of written this book. And I had laid it out and said, look, here's the definition and the deductive consequences of that definition are, uh, you know, if it's institution building, then it's necessarily managerial. And if it's about uncertainty, then it necessarily is not about industry or size of company or sector. And therefore, uh, I wrote with, you know, some confidence, but not a lot of experience. It, It should be equally applicable to companies of all different sizes. And I didn't know, frankly, if anyone would take me seriously. My experience at that time was was really concentrated in the kind of venture-backed startups you'd imagine here in Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I felt like I was drawing on ideas, including lean manufacturing and, and a bunch of others, that that certainly had a lot, plenty of relevancy in other contexts. And I felt like um, what's nice about working from first principles is that things become transferable across domains because – Thinking conceptually, not just extrapolating, you know, naively from uh, from direct experience. Anyway, so I kind of put it out into the world as an experiment and kind of see what would happen. And I, I was actually very surprised how many large companies reached out to me. You know, re- really starting right as soon as the book was published to say mm. we'd like to take you up on this challenge to put these ideas to the test in a really wide variety of uh, situations. And and it's been fun. It's it's been kind of a crazy a crazy ride, like almost like a backstage pass to the world of business. Um, you know, I've been kind of in every region, every geography, every kind of company, every order of magnitude of size company, from two founders in a garage up to multi hundreds of thousands and everything in between. So, uh, so yeah, so it's it's kind of been like one challenge after another to try to figure out, hey, if we found the limits of where these ideas could be applied yet, and so far not yet. Yeah, and it, you know, it's interesting. Um, you were talking about transferring uh, methods, ideas across industries. Um, 
you know, as we talked in the last podcast, you know, you, you cite Taichi Ono and, and um, you know, give uh, a lot of credit to Toyota in in your books. Um, you know, that was probably that that first leap back from large companies to figure out how do you adopt lean principles to a startup setting. Uh, I imagine early, early with your work in startups, you had some pushback of people saying, oh, well, you know, we don't build cars. We're not Toyota. I imagine you heard some. Oh, yeah. That. Oh, yeah. I can't tell you how many software engineers were like, why are we talking about manufacturing? Because I always try to talk about batch size. And, and, and uh, you know, we had the, the technological equivalents of the Andon cord and all this stuff. And, and so, you know, I had to, I had to learn to stop using the manufacturing metaphors in the, the Japanese lingo because people in Silicon Valley thought I was really weird. And then it was fun. So, so having been through that translation once, it was fun to now go the other way. Mm-hmm. And one of my proudest moments as we were doing this really massive transformation inside of GE, you know, really all these, we started really with, with very hardcore industrial type products because we wanted to demonstrate that these ideas could work across the whole company. So healthcare, energy extraction, I mean, really like manufacturing, industrial, heavy products, aviation, like serious stuff, you know? Yeah. And anyway, but because G is going through this really massive digital transformation themselves, eventually we started to touch the rest of the company. We did the, the internal functions and including IT and uh, you know, HR finance. And then we started to touch even their more cutting edge, like actual digital products that they make as part of what they call the industrial internet. And one of the trainings I was doing, uh, you know, I'm doing my typical Q&A with skeptical executives. And one of the executives says, okay, hot shot. Obviously, this idea is, these ideas are going to work in the state and boring you know, domain of manufacturing. But how is this going to apply to the world of high tech digital technology? <laughs> And I was like, oh, man, step into my office. This is the first time in two years anyone in this company's asked me a question I actually know something about. So this would be terrific. And, of course, this poor executive you know, walked into a house, uh, totally not having done his homework on, on what it was. So, yeah, my experience has basically been that no matter what people are doing, um, they will fixate on any difference between what they do and what the speaker is doing as a reason not to listen if they possibly can. Down to the level where you know people will say, "Well, sure, that worked for GE, but we're in a different industry, or you know, we're mm-hmm. it, that's not going to work in in healthcare, or like you know, <laughs> people will be like, well, 'Well, I'll work for medical devices, but it won't work in a hospital.' It's like, oh, well, it'll sure work in an oh. American hospital, but not in a rural hospital or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you've lived through that. I've anyway, heard all I, of that. Yeah, yeah, you've heard it all. And I mean, one time I was with a packaged goods company, and uh, you know, they were like, "Well, sure, that's going to work for this other." I, and I worked with a very close competitor you know, on something that was like on a different aisle of the, of the grocery store. And they were like, well, sure. It's going to work for, I can't remember your packaged foods, but it couldn't possibly work for packaged soaps or whatever. It was like, okay, well now we're down to like, we, this is sold in the same store, but you have to walk three aisles over. So therefore it doesn't count. Like, you know, come on. And what's funny is I, you know, I, I believe that the foundation of all these theories is the scientific method and really willing yeah. to apply empiricism to business problems, which, you would think would be an uncontroversial and fairly obvious idea given that, you know, for all of the improvements in living standards and just about everything else that's happened over the last 500 years, we owe it to this very basic conceptual framework. And yet yeah. business is often seen as exempt. So anyway, so, so what I always tell people is, look, if this is a scientific theory, then I don't want you to take it from me or any other expert on faith. You should run the experiment yourself to find out if I know what I'm talking about. So forget these like theoretical objections. Let's go try it out. And if I'm full of it, you'll teach me something. So like, what do we have to lose? And that's when the real conversation starts. Yeah. Now um, I'd like to you know, come back and talk more about GE because, you know, as I've followed um, you know, what you're doing, attended lean startup uh, week most every year, there, there have been a lot of stories on stage from GE, you know, one that yeah. stood out to me in particular a couple of years ago was the uh, the back and forth uh, uh, you know of ideas coming from Toyota production system and Ono and lean manufacturing into startups and then engineers from Toyota taking <laughs> lean startup methods yeah. <laughs> and applying it to some of their work. So I think my audience here, um, you know, uh, I think in particular would be really interested in any stories you can tell about Toyota's embrace of this because you know, I was reading just earlier this afternoon an article by Jeffrey Liker, you know, the author yeah. of the Toyota Way, who was making these same points about yeah, you know the, the Toyota approach. It's really about this way of thinking and structured yeah. scientific problem solving cycles, and and so yeah, that's that's good stuff. But what can you talk about uh, Toyota a little bit and how this came full circle? 
Oh yeah, I've had a lot of these full circle moments, and and it's been really fun. Yeah, sometimes at the, at the Lean Startup Conference, uh, as, as part of Lean Startup Week, we'll have a lean, a traditional lean manufacturing expert come, and we always have to give them a briefing. Listen, you're about to go to an audience of two thousand people who don't know that lean has an origin in manufacturing, so they don't understand what you're talking about. So just just FYI, you know, heads up, <laughs> be prepared. They they think lean is about startups and stuff, and they're always like, what? what, what this is crazy. So like. I definitely like when we have opportunities to foster collaboration between between these otherwise sometimes very siloed groups. But like, if you write about lean topics, getting an email from Toyota is a little bit like um, getting called in the principal's office. At least that's how it felt to me. I, I got an email out of the blue from an engineer uh, at um, uh, one of the Toyota divisions that is based in the United States, and he said, "Would you, you know, would you come in and talk to us?" Uh, about lean startup. And I, I, I was torn. I was like, is this going to be, am I going to be summoned in to, you know, call, be called to account for, for distorting the idea <laughs> yeah, or are they yeah. interested in what I had to say? But my view was our debt as lean practitioners to Toyota is mm-hmm. as close to unlimited as you can get. So you yeah. know, whatever they want, I'm, I'm there, even if it's just to reprimand me. And anyway, it turns out that was not the purpose of the, of the conversation. And it was a really terrific experience, you know, because first of all, of anyone who could be defensive about someone from the outside talking to them about something lean. I mean, they would have every right to say, Hey, what the hell do you know? Mm-hmm. You've never manufactured a car a day in your life or anything. And, uh, you know, I, I, at the point that I first met them, I'd rarely ever set foot in a factory of any kind. So, so skepticism was totally warranted, but they, they were really very open and transparent about it and very interested. And in, as I was saying before, in running those experiments and the issue that they were having, um, I don't think I'm speaking out of school here to say that, they have historically treated the kind of consumer electronics and IT components of a car as if they were just regular, um, you know, regular parts that, you know, the, the design and manufacturing of which can be outsourced to specialized vendors, just like mm-hmm. you would with any other kind of uh, any other kind of part. And as a result, they have historically done the digital part of uh, car manufacturing on the same cycle times as the physical part of manufacturing which made sense at a time when software development cycle times were not that different from physical production mm-hmm. cycle times. But now that's really not true. So it puts them at a real disadvantage. Uh, their software, you know, always looks and feels really clunky compared to what people are used to, you know, in their, uh, in their smartphone or what have you. Yeah. And even I remember telling them a story um, that really offended them at the time. It's not the initial folks who I talked to, but later, as I was meeting some of the engineers and executives from Japan, I, I told them a story that I personally drove a Toyota Prius and I had bought it in the in the year of the brake scandal. If everyone remembers mm-hmm. that, what was that, 2010? I remember I, the, the news had just broken that the cars were defective. And I remember my wife saying, are you sure we can buy this car? When I said, listen, it's Toyota. I don't believe the story. There's no way there's a brakes problem at the guy just like this is not true. We don't have to worry about it. I had such confidence in the quality of the products that, that we bought. And I feel very, you know, of course mm-hmm. vindicated. Yeah. The car's been terrific. And I but I said, but I paid a lot of extra money to get the in-car navigation, you know, system installed from direct from Toyota. And within a month of buying this brand new car, I noticed that the $250 Garmin crappy GPS I had used before which I had thought was gone from my life forever was back on the dashboard yeah. because uh, you know, my family found the GPS in the car unusable, like not just hard to use, but actually unusable. Mm-hmm. And I remember saying to them, listen, that's a quality problem. This car is defective. Mm-hmm. Or it doesn't meet and customer needs at least. It doesn't meet the customer needs. And so we should see that as a, and, and you know, the idea that I'm suggesting that a Toyota product is defective in quality was really offensive, but you know, that's that's my point of view, that quality needs to be defined in the eyes of the customer. And if we're building a product that customers don't want, that's nothing to be proud of. Mm-hmm. And the fact that we happen to be in a historical moment where the manufacturing quality of the car still supersedes the customer requirements you know, in terms of the overall purchasing decision. Every year, it's a little bit less important compared to these other user experience elements to the point where we know that in the future, those elements are going to absolutely dominate. Anyway, so it was a, a conversation around how could we treat the, the car development to take into account the need for this kind of innovation. And of course, the people who had brought me into the company were part of the you know, IT and research arms of the company, and they had been long trying to push the company in this direction. And Lean Startup gave them a framework to have the conversation with their colleagues 
uh, in Japan and, and in the rest of the organization under a framework that everybody understood, which is a really important part of Lean Startup. It's a really important part why I tried really hard to develop it out of existing theoretically sound framework so that we could find those points of compatibility and therefore integrate it into organizations uh, more easily. And I tell a little bit of the story of the specific uh, products and experiments we ran together in the book, including one of these meetings with uh, with Tomiyama-san, one of the senior executives who who was really one of the people in Japan who's been pushing Toyota to be more innovative now over many years. And he was on one of his periodic tours of the different Toyota outposts. And when he was in California, he, he and his entourage met with me. And it was, you know, it's one of these very funny culture clash moments where it's me. Uh, you know, I don't have any any staff. I'm not, I don't run a consulting company. So it's not like I brought 40 associates to the meeting. It's just me, a few of the American engineers who had, you know, instigated this project. And we're looking to him to sponsor them in doing this, this transformation. And he, of course travel with a significant entourage from Japan. Um, the book had just been translated into Japanese. So I got the sense that the entourage had read the book, but he didn't speak, of course, for most of the meeting. So I had no idea what was going on. If he was pleased, if he didn't like it, he was totally <laughs> stoic. And I'm doing my best to make myself understood. And finally, you know, the meeting gets to a moment where someone, somehow everyone else knows the cue to stop talking. And he speaks and he said, um, you know, this is the missing half mm. of a Toyota production system. I'll never forget that. It was like one of those like incredible moments where he's, you know, he was really focused on how do we develop a system as a company that's as good for discovering what to build, what the new customer preferences are as it is at once we know what those answers are, then in building it with high quality. And that was really the framing of our whole collaboration, which was, uh, you know, to do this stuff to, to build those two systems together so that we could be mm-hmm. discovering and executing, experimenting and executing uh, together. Yeah. And then just to kind of cap the story with a recent uh, recent thing that, that I discovered um, that's not in the book. I recently met um, a group called Toyota AI Ventures, which is part of TRI here in Silicon Valley. And they are both uh, in investing in external entrepreneurs um, and startups that are related to obviously they need to bring autonomy and, and AI into vehicles but they also have a mandate to drive innovation in the company and as you know as we were talking they you know they were talking to me about how the transformation that we started with this very these very simple small projects um, you know on the research side of the organization have had all this impact out through the company and, and how there's this real mandate from the very senior leadership in Japan to try and drive this kind of transformation, get the company to think more in a more innovative way and to adopt startup and, and venture backed um, uh, items. And of course, um, Tomoyama-san has his fingerprints all over it. it is by, by yeah. no coincidence, uh, he's once again uh, uh, pushing that. So he's been he's really been the champion of several related initiatives now that I think are having a big impact on the company. So it's been really cool to see those ideas kind of make their way back into the mothership as yeah. well. Yeah, and I'll, I'll post a link in the, the blog post uh, for the episode here. There's a, a video, it's still, I just checked, it's still uh, online from the 2013 Lean Startup Conference, those two engineers telling the story yeah. about development of uh, the, the, the in-dash unit. And, you know, it would be disappointing, I think, as, as a Toyota observer, you know, to, to see if Toyota was not willing to improve the way they are oh, right, right. Right. Exactly. products. And, you know, as much as they talk about continuous improvement, um, yeah, they, they, maybe we bring it back to the, you know, the scientific idea here when you say, you know, this thought process of discovering what to build is is different than a thought process of knowing what to build with with a high That's degree right. of certainty. And you know, this seems like the stories from GE and others at at the conferences have been stories about coming to grips with the idea, you know, that we don't know, but we can go and discover and test and and iterate and as basic as That's right. teams. It's 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 a, that's a phenomenal difference, right? Yeah, and you think I would add. It's okay not to know. Mm-hmm. Like it's not a mark of shame. It's a fact of life that the world we live in is highly uncertain. And we often are either the victims of that uncertainty because the industry we're in starts to change around us, or we are the instigators of that uncertainty. I think what people forget is that whenever we're trying to do something fundamentally new, we're trying to upend the status quo. We're trying to create uncertainty for our competitors, but also for ourselves because we don't know if it's going to work or if it does work, how it's going to work. So kind of being 
honest about those facts actually creates a huge opportunity to get away from a bunch of corporate habits of thinking that are fairly, um, what's the right word? They they prevent us from being honest. They prevent mm-hmm. us from taking risks. They prevent mm-hmm. us from like, thinking creatively. And I, I feel the same way as you as an observer of Toyota, as someone who knew them only from the outside and from books, you know, and what I had read. It was such a, such a treat to see them live their values up close, even in an area where they were struggling. Mm-hmm. So this is the controversial issue within the company, and it's just causing a lot of conflict. And unlike a lot of companies I've seen try to grapple with these issues, they also really did it their way. You know, this project could easily have been. It would either be it would either be too junior. The people who introduced the idea were too small, too unimportant to matter, mm. so it wouldn't be funded at all. Or if they did convince senior management to do this, the project would be managed centrally from Japan, and you know, fancy people would would be in charge of it because now it has a budget. And this was just a just a really classic Toyota example where they had they did have to work hard to build consensus and work up and down the chain of, of command to to get this project approved. But once it was approved, the control of the project and the budget was really allocated locally to the people doing the actual work. Uh, and they really had a lot of freedom to design and implement it and you know kicked off more and more ways of that kind of consensus building to figure out what to do with the results of the learning that they got. Yeah. So it right. was it was neat to see it in action. Yeah, and I think there's a good lesson there of of them making it their own, the same way any uh, you know healthcare system might take what they've learned from Toyota or another health system and making it their own, giving it their own branding. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit more about you know GE and and what they've dubbed FastWorks was their internal sure. branding, and I, I assume it was their way of making it their own as well. Yes, this is definitely a pattern I noticed is that the people that do this successfully make it their own. And that includes building their own branding for it, often um, using their own terminology or modifying existing terminology. Uh, and, the, the, and of course, people forget, I, I would often remind people manufacturing a Toyota, they call it the Toyota production system. So we had a sound cut out there. Eric was saying they don't call it lean manufacturing at Toyota. It's just the Toyota production system. Back to Eric. So they're not bound by some abstract theory that somebody else invented. They think it's their own. And, you know, of course, people who study this closely understand that what Toyota production system looks like is different in different places and in different divisions and in different geographies. And they, you know, they really understand that it's a mindset, a set of principles, not some rote formula that you just execute step by step. Yeah. So the, the companies like GE, you know, I remember when they first told me they were going to brand it FastWorks. I, you know, I, I thought it was kind of a goofy name. <laughs> The Valley Company would would use that kind of branding, but as I as I got to learn the culture and history of the company, it made sense. You know, it tied into past things that they had done, like Eco Imagination and Six Sigma and um, Workout. So it kind of it had a certain kind of hokiness to it that was actually <laughs> consonant with their corporate mm-hmm. culture. Mm-hmm. And I, I, that was really what I learned is that this is this has to be an indigenous transformation. You can't do it because some outside consultant told you to do it. You have to really want to do it. And it, you have to kind of walk this balance where you are bringing in expertise from the outside, just like you think about the original lean manufacturing senseis and the role that they played in so many lean transformations. So you, there are external, there's external expertise being brought in, yeah. but it's coming in at the invitation of insiders who are going to own the program. Mm-hmm. So that was really, I think, a smart thing that the CEO did um, from very early on with this. We ran some initial experiments together. Um, there were... The experiments were overseen at a very high level so that, you know, we, we did these workshops where they would have like a lot of senior vice presidents in the room just to observe, which is not exactly the greatest environment for a workshop about failure and openness to learning and whatever. Uh, but but the idea was that they really wanted to make sure that, that, that this works, so run the experiment, really be sure. And then if it works, really task the senior leaders with with rolling it out. So when this became a formal program inside the company. Uh, there was an initial steering committee, like a board of directors, to oversee it. It was comprised of uh, head of marketing, head of technology, uh, head of the global research, effectively the CTO of the company, uh, head of HR, IT, and finance. So the most important um, functions and the most senior leaders of those functions were overseeing this personally, and they were jointly accountable to the CEO for mm. executing it. Mm. And that just made such a big difference. It, it meant that this was going to get senior level championship from the very beginning. It also meant that it was not going to run into the typical uh, functional silo problem where people say, well, it's just a marketing initiative. So why the hell do I have to do it in engineering or it's just a technology initiative? Why do I have to do it in HR or whatever? 
um, this really allowed us to work cross-functionally and to build cross-functional teams to demonstrate that that's what's required in order to do the kind of work we're talking about. Yeah. Well, you know, and there are parallels, um, in, you know, what you're talking about to, you know, what I've seen in healthcare and other settings, the idea of breaking down um, silos, creating cross-functional teams. Um, you know, there, there are common themes here where I, I think, you know, maybe there's a balance, you know, people, organizations should make it their own, but there are maybe certain boundaries. So if an organization in healthcare said, we, we've embraced lean and we've given our own flavor, but we're not trying to engage everybody in continuous improvement. All oh, right. Yeah, kind, of, totally. kind of give me pause. And, and, you know, sadly that, that happens, but so you know, bring it back to the startup way. I, there, there's a parallel of, of not just getting everybody involved in continuous improvement, but the idea that innovation and entrepreneurial methods are something that anybody can use in the organization. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you, do you get pushback on that? That no, well, no innovation. Oh, people think I'm crazy. We have, we have oh, yeah. An center for that. Or if you if you think about how radical it was to suggest that factory workers and line managers you know, could be involved using their own creativity in the improvement of the work process that they executed. Um, this is like just, you know, I don't know if it's just as crazy or more crazy, but people find it so bizarre. I mean, I feel like there's still organizations that have that, find that idea difficult. And here I am saying that you might already employ the next Steve Jobs. And not only that, you might be on the verge of firing them because they're not important to you. And they might have a business card and be paid badly. And they might you know, be this insignificant figure in your organization, which people forget describes the actual Steve Jobs in real life. <laughs> you know, it's like people are always like, oh, I, I really want to have the next Mark Zuckerberg work for me or whatever. But like, you know, if you go back to the creation of Apple, um, I, I think Jobs, <laughs> Jobs was unemployed at the time. But Wozniak was working as an engineer at HP and he begged HP to commercialize the prototype that he and Jobs were making. He was going to give it to them for free out of his feeling of loyalty to them because he worked there. Mm. But he was not an important person, so nobody cared. And he, he took it to every division where he knew someone in the company. He was rejected everywhere. And they're like, fine, we'll go create the mo world's most valuable company on our own. <laughs> and HP will get nothing out of it. <laughs> Eventually, we'll go be part of what causes HP to, to go to have a near bankruptcy experience. People can't believe that. It's just too crazy to think. And yet, I really have seen it with my own eyes. So I tell in the book a story of one of these projects that is like you're just classic like corporate death ball type projects. It was a joint venture between uh, an IT and finance group. So when I talk to product people and I start telling the story, they start like groaning in the audience like, oh, God, right? This is a 25 person committee. No one's on the project full time. Everyone's part time, you know, five or 10 percent of their time to do this committee to over the course of 18 months, develop a new global standard for one of the company's internal uh, IT finance processes that had to do with you know, the corporate consolidation and chart of accounts by which they do the annual reporting. At the time that I got involved, the process that they're trying to improve consumed, let's see if I get this number right. I believe it took 1% of the company's global workforce one month every quarter mm. to do this process. So it's just a fantastically expensive thing that's being done every quarter. And because it's implicated in the quarterly reporting, you know, because of Sarbanes-Oxley, like executives go to jail if this information is not. Mm. And yet it was loaded up with manual steps and Excel spreadsheets and just people kind of going outside the work. And there were 92 different uh, IT systems that didn't talk to each other and required all this. It was just like your definition of a giant corporate mess. And the way that they were planning to go about it was your very standard corporate project. You know, this is this is not really um, considered normally a place where you need innovation. You just need to get everybody on the same page, build consensus, come up with a standard, and then implement it. So the plan when I met them was this 25-person committee would meet for 18 months, do what they called requirements gathering. I really hate the word requirements yeah. because the laws of physics are required. Everything else is optional. But this is a requirements gathering, which means asking all their different customer stakeholders. Uh, they never used the word customer, by the way. They're stakeholders. What do you want in this system? Everyone gets to load it up with all their feature requests mm -hmm. and things that they want, including all the people who don't really want this project to succeed, who are like, well, it has to give me a new pony and wash my car and blah, blah, blah. You take all that stuff. You basically put it in a binder. You print it out, <laughs> put it in a binder, and then... They were going to hand this specification document to the CIOs of all the PLs in the company and insist that they implement this same one global standard. 
which would then take another 18 months. So the theory was 36 months from now, the company will have this incredible productivity savings because we will simultaneously roll out this one single IT system across every division and everything will be standardized and perfect. And you know, if I tell any, any normal employee of any company what they think the probability of success of this project yeah. is, it just start laughing, right? Like we all know what's going to happen. We've lived through this so many times. This is going to be a corporate mandate handed down from headquarters. By the time anything gets implemented, it's going to be completely wrong. There's going to be absolutely no accountability because this committee will have been disbanded for 18 months by the time anything actually ships. And all the committee members have to say to any of the CIOs who are pissed off about it is say, well, did you implement my recommendations exactly as it's in the binder? Hmm. And of course not. Of course, changes had to be made to accommodate local conditions or like sometimes the binder is full of contradictory instructions that couldn't possibly. But whatever the difference is, well, that's the reason why if you'd only done what I right. So we're all going to be blaming each other. We're going to spend tremendous money on this and we're not going to get a productivity savings. We all know it. So first of all, why do we do this? Like, why do we do these projects if we all know for sure that they're going to fail? That's Mm. maybe a conversation for another day. But even if you say, okay, we're going to do it, why do it this way? So right. this was a, a project came into one of my trainings. We taught them the Lean Startup Method. I, I thought that I thought I would be assassinated by the people in this room. They were so resistant to the idea that we had to take a customer service mentality. I remember they said to me, we don't have customers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the employees of this company have to use this. It, it's not optional. They are required to do it. I was like, well... Uh, how's your compliance rate so far? You just told me that you have thousands of people working at this company who are working around your existing mandates. So sounds to me like they have a choice. Why is this time going to be different? So let's treat them like customers. Let's admit that employees always have a choice. Right? So we just went through this very basic stuff and let's treat this like a startup. If I was trying to tell you, you should invest in my brand new IT based startup here in Silicon Valley. And what we're going to do is sell to corporations and get them to totally revamp their IT HR. You'd be like, well, that's a really risky thing. Are you Mm -hmm. sure you know, right? We treat that like a high risk, high reward startup with tremendous upside if it works, but tremendous risk that it might not. Why is it any different just because the people happen to work for us already? It's it's the same dynamic. So after, after three days working with them, they came up with a new plan. And the new plan was so shocking to the people in the company who saw them present it that I was accused on more than one occasion of slipping something into the water mm. that produced psychedelic effects. Because what, what, what did you do? What was the trick to this? All of a sudden, this 25-person committee asked if they could be consolidated down to a five-person full-time team. They, they, so they got rid of 20 people voluntarily. In corporate settings, you never decrease your headcount, right? That's suicide. Mm. They, they said, instead of rolling this thing out over 18 months, we're going to go try to find a CEO level, a PL leader uh, customer. We will offer to each potential customer that if they say yes to be a pilot site for this new software, we will take our entire team, put them on a plane to their headquarters, wherever they are in the world, and we will camp out in their headquarters till this project is done to their mm-hmm. satisfaction. First MVP will be shipped within 30 days. And every 90 days, we will voluntarily offer them a new version of the software to see if we can get them to switch over. They don't have to switch over until they actually believe it's better than what they have now. And on top of that, we will not leave their headquarters until we prove to them with real metrics that we have achieved a productivity improvement in their work process. And then and only then will we attempt to take it to a second site, do the same thing over, reconcile the difference, refactor, take it to four sites, eight sites, 16 sites, and eventually scale it up through hyper growth of the whole company. Yeah. And here's the kicker. When I tell this story, this is the part that nobody believes. I say these five people who did this project, they struck me as every bit the passion, creativity, intensity, hunger, scarcity mindset, innovation as the true startups I meet here in the South American neighborhood in San Francisco. And if you looked at their resume, you just can't believe it. These Mm -hmm. are people who've never done a creative thing in their life. So far as the resume says, these are lifetime IT finance corporate people, right? They don't, no one can believe that. Well, I mean, they're entrepreneurs, right? An entrepreneur is supposed to be wearing a hoodie. He went to Stanford and he's 21. (laughs) This guy's 45 and he's got really good health benefits and he's got a family. And he, did I mention he spent 20 years as an IT lifer? So how could he be an entrepreneur? Yeah. And yet, you know, I try to make the case in the book, of course, about why this is true. But the most important thing I can say is you got to believe me because I've seen it with my own eyes. I've witnessed it firsthand multiple times. So I try to kind of tell those stories and get people to see 
that there's like this incredible latent energy and creativity available in our existing organizations that we absolutely squander today. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you know, I hope that sounds very familiar to people who are listening, um, you know, and, and other organizations that are having that discussion about um, latent creativity that's being wasted around not uh, engaging people in continuous improvement. Um, there's, there's a parallel theme there. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It's really the same. It's the same issue, but applied in a new domain. So, you know, there's there's a time and a place for optimizing an existing workflow that we know creates value, but has some waste embedded in it. And there's a time and place for building a new value stream from scratch where we don't know. Forget the idea of whether it has any waste in it or not. We don't really know if it creates any value at all. So it's not like no one's ever done that. It's just that I think our attention has been, you know, has not tended to be drawn there because to be fair, uh, in the 20th century, most business value came from the kind of scaling of existing and kind of really well understood products and, and supply chains. So, so I don't mean this as a criticism of what came before, but rather a, a new extension of our older management ideas into a new world. Mm-hmm. I mean, we live in a, in a world that, that the early 20th century management pioneers that we all revere would have found absolutely unrecognizable. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, one of the other things you know from your story that makes me think of other types of organizations. You know, you talked earlier. It's okay not to know. Uh, I think there's a, or a dynamic in big companies that uh, they they want perfection. And maybe you know, is there a similar thought of you know, it's okay not to be perfect because we will learn and iterate and improve. And I mean, that that should be freeing in a way. But I could see where the discomfort would yeah. come from. It's actually tricky. I used to say exactly what you just said, that it's okay not to be yeah. perfect. And that just, it was such a problem because people would say, well, I don't, I like if it sets up continuous improvement against perfection. Like we don't seek out perfection and it allows the people who want to delay and work in large batches and kind of sit in their cave and just think great thoughts as if, as if those work processes deliver perfection ever. So I used to, I got used to telling people, listen, if I interviewed your customers right now, would they tell me your product launches are generally perfect? Sure, they would. We all agree they came in way late, way over budget. But are they perfect, at least, to compensate us for these massive delays? Oh, what's that you say? <laughs> your customers hate your new products? Mm-hmm. Okay, so can we admit, first of all, the status quo is not delivering perfection? And that's, of course, because when was the last time you met with someone who was working on a project and they said, I have an idea. In order to make my project more perfect, I'm going to go slower think harder about it, but by myself with no customer input, I'm going to have more politics and bureaucracy and meetings. Yeah. Like what, what is the evidence that that produces perfect outcomes? The thing that produces perfect outcomes is to measure and learn and improve. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's the old lean idea going back to Deming. Yeah. So, so we just want to apply that same thing here. This is the pursuit of perfection, but uh, in order to be, take something more perfect, you have to admit that it ever was imperfect. <laughs> Right. So this is just being honest about the fact that the products we make are imperfect, and the best way to make them better is to ship them to some customers with you know a limited scope at the beginning, so that we don't embarrass ourselves too widely. Learn what we can and improve with each iteration. And in fact, for physical products, especially a factory that is set up for single piece flow, is especially well adapted to do this because we can use the same ability to kind of make every product a custom order. We can use those same capabilities to run more experiments by yeah. by diversifying the specification set at low volume. So I remember I was with a fa- I was in a factory where this is like such a classic uh, situation. The, the, I was meeting with the union leaders and as well as the uh, four people of this factory, and they were having this problem that the product they made there uh, hadn't changed in like ten years, and volume of, that was being purchased by consumers was decreasing. But they couldn't convince the company to invest in a whole new revamp of this product because that's a multi-year expensive process. And the very fact that that, that customer demand was dwindling made their budget too small to justify it. So it's like totally perverse. They're caught on this classic corporate catch-22 that because no one's buying their product, they can't make it better. And I remember saying to them, well, one of the issues clearly is that this product is superficially old. Like this is a consumer product still. Yes, it's industrial. Yes, it's it's you know requires manufacturing, but it's it's still something that, that individual consumers buy in a store. It looks old because you haven't even refreshed the design. The superficial elements haven't been refreshed in a long time. 
So why don't we go get a sense of whether that, you know, whether there's an opportunity to run some experiments would, would an improved design or some better usability, you know, at the surface, would that make a difference? Well, we, we don't have permission to run those experiments. I was like, permission from who? Like, you know, and they were like, I looked at me like, what do you mean permission from who? We just know that that's not our job. And of course, it was helpful to actually have a union leader there because I was like, listen, are you comfortable with all the people working in this factory being laid off? Because that's the, that's the, if I draw you a straight extrapolation line from where we are to five years from now, no, none of you are going to work here anymore. And they're like, no, we, we really don't want that. So we started to say, all right, let's go find out who, whose permission we have to get. And, you know, I, I'm only there at the invitation of management. So it's easy for me to be like, let's go call up the senior people and tell them the story and see what they think. And of course, if, as soon as they heard what we were talking about, they're like, well, we don't want to do an expensive program. We can't afford it. And I said, well, that's okay. Do you mind if we use our existing resources? Because remember, there's all this waste in this factory, especially because it's not running at optimal volume anymore. So you got union workers sitting around doing nothing, but being paid to be there. So could we use some of that excess capacity to run some experience? And they're like, okay, whatever. As long as it doesn't cost any money, do whatever you want, now, including selling products to customers and store. Like, we don't care, whatever. You know, like, get out of my office. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Yeah. So I was like, listen, you got, you got freedom to do it. So then, you know, then I actually had to go to product designers and the product management organizations. Hey, we want to run these experiments. And they were all like, well, you'll never get the union guys to do that. That's, you know, forget it. Those guys are lazy and they don't want to do anything different. They just do what we, and I'm like, well, <laughs> Look who I have behind door number two. Yeah. Surprise! We, we 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 could test that right. hypothesis. You, you know, you, right? Exactly. Like, guess guess who's sitting right behind me in this meeting? I, did you even pay attention? Right. So, like, you start to be like, okay, if, if we get all this bullshit out of the way, pardon my language, can we actually run the experiment? And then people start like, well, it doesn't matter. It's not going to make a difference. So it's not worth running the experiment. It's like, okay, so you concede that if it did make a difference, that might change your answer. So can we run the experiment? Anyway, after we get through all this corporate politics, which was like annoying, but you know, it took a couple of days. It's not like a, this is not a rocket science, you know, then finally we're like, okay, so what do you want to do? And they started like, you know, I was like, can we start with something simple? Can we, can we try a couple of units with a different color? Can we try, you know, different configuration? And they started to brainstorm about what was possible. And they were like, well, we don't really know what's possible until we bring some people from the floor and like, we had to kind of find out what was the extra capacity that we had and what, and luckily, this factory had gone through a traditional lean transformation. So you actually had lean experts um, right, right there who we could go to and say, hey, listen, could we repurpose some of these changes you're making for the purpose of doing low batch size experiments? I want 50 bespoke units or mm -hmm. five sometimes uh, to a new custom order. And everyone thought it was a weird request. Like No one was used to thinking that way. But we had the capabilities right on hand. And then we could start to figure out what is the problem? Like, why is it really that demand is dwindling and what can we do about it? And of course, as was often the case, it had nothing to do with what anybody thought it was. Um, they made all kinds of very unusual discoveries anyway, and, and they were able to get back on track. So yeah, it was like we unlocked this, this new way of thinking right from the factory floor. And I like that story because, and they were already doing a lean transformation. Hmm. So they were already bought into mm -hmm. continuous improvement. And and using the creativity of every person, and they, like that, they were on board ideologically, but they were not accustomed to using those capabilities in a new domain. So that that part of it was really was really cool. And that you know, I feel like that kind of illustrates the difference between continuous improvement and continuous innovation. Mm -hmm. We're not just trying to come up with one new product at one time, and then like it's it's an innovation and we're done. It's seeing that just like you might try to improve the margins of a product at all times by making it more efficient to produce. There's another way to improve margins on a continuous basis, which is to make the product more desirable to customers. Mm -hmm. uh, and they sh we should treat them equivalently yeah. continuously. So there's, the uh, to me, an interesting parallel between continuous improvement of existing process, continuous innovation of new products or services or process um, yeah. approaches. In, in the book, you also talk about continuous transformation. Um, can can you touch on that a little bit and how those thoughts extend to the idea of trying to transform an organization with sure. the lean or the startup way methods? Yeah. So this really requires a bit of of kind of a, taking the argument piece by piece. And and I, I the way I this is how it mentally fits in the landscape for me. I really see the lean startup as trying to take a reader from the idea that maybe they would like to do innovation and eventually to this kind of more avant garde idea that they should do continuous innovation. And so the startup way kind of picks up the baton from uh, starting from a premise that we want to do continuous innovation and, and work entrepreneurially. And we see that as a source of new, you know, new growth and revitalization down the road. Um, and then wants to walk the reader from that to this more avant-garde idea of continuous transformation. And the steps of the argument go like this. 
if you want to do innovation, then you need a tool in your toolbox to attack those problems on a regular basis. I call it the startup as an atomic unit of work. So you have to be willing to say that like that 25 person IT finance committee, that's the wrong structure to get the work done. We need a startup. So what is a startup? And, you know, I kind of lay out mm-hmm. practices from Silicon Valley, how it works, right? Like a small cross-functional team with a scarcity mentality with what we call metered funding that they have a fixed resource budget to, uh, to apply that's accountable to a board of directors. It's not governed by kind of your usual kind of corporate review process, which is just not at all suited to, to innovation, building a minimum viable product using a system we call innovation accounting to measure results, uh, et cetera. So it's like a special kind of tool in your toolbox and like, uh, you know, companies like Amazon do this all the time. They have what they call the two pizza team, a team no longer no larger than you can feed with two pizzas. And that's just one of their corporate rules that when they're trying something new, they're going to throw a two pizza team at it. And that's how AWS started. That's how all kinds of their internal initiatives started. That's uh, and they don't always succeed. Like right? they, they had a two pizza team that built the Amazon Fire Phone, which was like one of their big mm. disasters. Right. That you know they failed very expensively, very publicly, very embarrassing for Jeff Bezos personally. And uh, you know, he has all these quotes in the press where he's like, yeah, I, it's my job to make sure that we fail enough. Hmm. And so, yeah, it happens. And if you look at the history, like many of the people that were involved with the Fire Phone went on to create all kinds of successful products for Amazon, including mm-hmm. Alexa, mm-hmm. Fire TV and all stuff. So you just got to be willing to treat this as like a tool in your toolbox. Yeah. But then now you have a new problem after you do that. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, that the, 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 you know, the, the fire phone was you know, a very public failure. It got to market. I wonder if there were opportunities to have anticipated, uh, you know, by uh, some of those failures uh, in, in more private ways. When I think about continuous improvement, and I think there's similar discussion in the startup world. Um, failure is good if you learn from it. That's not this exactly. failure fetish. We don't, it's not carte blanche to go do all sorts of crazy, irresponsible things. It's a structured, but not horribly bureaucratic approach to making, um, you know, I've heard Toyota people say you make lots of small mistakes to avoid big mistakes. That's right. Well, you know, no problem is a big problem. Mm -hmm. So if, if if we pretend that there's no failure in our process, then we're lying about it, Mm -hmm. or we're being so conservative as to be getting non-optimal results, although it's much more likely that we're lying about it, too, yeah. if we're being really honest here. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, yeah, we're not, you know, and, and, and a minimum viable product and the internal startup has to come with really strong liability constraints. So it's like a whole discipline to this to make sure that we've really anticipated the worst case scenario and we've and we've thought it through. Um, but the nice thing about it is this allows then two different styles of working to coexist within the same organization because we can have, we can still do traditional product management, we can still do traditional manufacturing, right? Like no one's mm-hmm. suggesting that for a product that we market for for 25 years, we have, you know, we're producing at massive scale that, you know, where we do have good ability to forecast demand in a seasonal way, right? Like that's, that's fine to continue to use traditional management techniques, including lean manu- management techniques for that. That's totally fine. We just have to be able to coexist with a totally different situation, which is this more internal startup. Mm-hmm. And then once you have two different things happening within the organization, it starts to raise organizational problems because now what function are these new entrepreneurs in? It's like a classic issue that comes up all the time. Who on the org chart is responsible for managing work of this type? Who comes into work thinking every day about the risks of disruption and the ability to, you know, to act as insurance against them or to harness them for future growth? In most organizations, it's either everybody's responsible for that, which in other words, nobody, or it's maybe, if you're really lucky, it's some executive's part-time job. Hmm. So the head of IT, head of marketing, head of engineering tend to be the, the lucky winners of the innovation sweepstakes. And it's like on the list of things they worry about every day, like number 20 out of 20 is oh, we should probably innovate to. And neither of those is really adequate to the task ahead of us, especially if any of these startups start to succeed. Yeah, it starts as a two pizza team, but it tends to then you know, metastasize into something larger. Sometimes you'll have 25 two pizza teams now all of a sudden working on something that's found product market fit. And yeah. you don't want the organization to treat that like a tumor to be excised. You really want it to be seen uh, as, a, as a new source of growth and therefore maybe even a new division of the company. Mm-hmm. So in order for that to happen, uh, we have to solve the problem I call the missing function. That there's just there is no or place on the org chart for entrepreneurship, and I think in the future that's going to look just as silly 
to kind of everyday managers as it was before the invention of marketing or finance as an independent discipline. So can you can you imagine a it's modern? Hard, it's hard to imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like that's crazy to imagine, and yet they were not always chief marketing officers. Like it's a relatively recent phenomenon. My favorite part reading like the early books about uh, scientific management and all that stuff is these guys were managing machine shops. They okay, were not talking about General Motors here. Yeah. We're talking about machine shops, like multi-product, relatively small businesses. And they didn't have enough accounting sophistication to know which products made them money mm-hmm. and which ones they lost money on. Like, they didn't have good marginal accounting. They didn't know what their marginal profit was. Um, they had a really hard time with statistics. They didn't have the basic statistical theories that we take for granted. So like, it was really difficult to run business without finance. We, we're so lucky to have inherited this incredible functional discipline that we, like, you'll never meet an organization of any size without a CFO. It's considered, you know, uh, absolutely necessary. So uh, why is entrepreneurship any different? And so we have to kind of develop that as a, as a new corporate form. Yeah that is both responsible for overseeing the company's internal startups and therefore the kind of continuous innovation program, but is also required to integrate entrepreneurial type thinking across the whole rest of the organization in the same way that lean can't be confined to the factory floor. It starts to grow out to the adjacent functions and eventually touch the whole organization and touch the whole supply chain. The same thing is true here. Yeah. And now, now I can finally get around to answering your question because you say, okay, if we're going to adopt a new, and more modern corporate form to add entrepreneurship as a function, how the hell are we going to do that? <laughs> you know, like, okay, now what? You say, okay, we have to do a corporate transformation. So this is a very particular kind of corporate transformation with a very particular kind of difficult challenges that I you know, try to outline in the book. And I, and I try to make the case that transforming the structure of an organization is also an entrepreneurial challenge. It has to start small. It Mm -hmm. has to scale quickly once it's proven. It has to have a certain kind of funding and accountability structure. And then finally, if you buy my argument all this way, that transformation is a kind of entrepreneurship, doesn't it sound kind of stupid to just do it once? You know, like, I feel like there's always management gurus that are like, if you just, I have the best ideas of all time. If you just follow me, your organization will like be permanently in a fine spot and you never have to do anything else again. And right. so everyone wants to be like the last management guru or whatever. I just feel like <laughs> I'm of the Peter Drucker school of gurus, right? He used to say, uh, people call me a guru because they can't spell charlatan. <laughs> I don't want to be anybody's guru. I mean, it's just give me a break. Yeah. This is not the one true management system for all time. This is at best the first management system that contains within it the seeds of its own evolution. Yeah. So what that says is that we should treat the like we should anticipate the need to transform again and again and again throughout the 21st century but we shouldn't treat those like the old top-down 20th century reorgs to nowhere mm-hmm. where we're just shuffling the deck chairs on the titanic like, this is going to be experimental and scientific and really driven by the, the needs of workers on the ground yeah. and so that's my idea we should we should treat corporate transformation as the kind of as a corporate resource a discipline that we have to mm-hmm. master in order to be able to kind of handle the waves of disruption that are coming our way. Just saying, uh, people feel like the 21st century so far has been rocky and difficult and confusing and uncertain. You ain't seen nothing yet. (laughs) Yeah. So it's going to get so much worse. This roller coaster is about to start going awfully fast. And uh, I just don't feel like our organizational forums are ready for it. Yeah. Well, and yeah, (laughs) there's a lot of thoughts that come to mind. One is the idea of, you know, organizations in healthcare who, uh, you know, complain about the the uncertainty out there in the political and health reform environment. And they say, well, we're, we're going to put our continuous improvement efforts on hold until that gets sorted out. And I'm thinking like, well, oh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, like, I do. I don't say I, it, it's hard to challenge people, uh, you know, that doing nothing is a good strategy in times of increasing uncertainty. Um, it's only going to get more uncertain and, and more crazy in the future. So it seems like, you know, that that same oh, yeah. advice that you're saying, start small learn, iterate, scale quickly. Organizations I work with don't flip a light switch and, and suddenly get a culture of continuous improvement. They start somewhere and they get successes and they take their lumps, but they do that on a small scale instead of you know, something that uh, is a problem company-wide and, and you go from there. So I'll, I'll get off my soapbox. Yeah, no, you got it. You, know, you got it. About that. And I could, I could not agree more. And, and the idea that like being rigid and static is the best way to surf a wave and you yeah. know deal with constantly gyrating change is like it 
it's it's appealing in that it's comforting if it was true, but there's yeah. absolutely no evidence to suggest that it's a rational strategy under any circumstance. Yeah, right. Well, and you know, one of the other things that you know, comes to mind when you talk about this um, entrepreneurship function, it, it seems you know squarely different than you know this has been trendy in healthcare. The quote, the quote unquote innovation center. Well, we will put innovative Uh-oh. people yeah. in a department, in teach a them design thinking. They will innovate. It seems like this entrepreneurship function is more a parallel to organizations that have an internal lean or process improvement department or whatever they label it. It's not that that group is responsible for doing it, but that group trains, coaches, pushes, uh, hopefully it doesn't turn up the heat too high in terms of embedding, as you were saying, you know, entrepreneurship or embedding lean all throughout the organization. Toyota even internally has a small group that is sort of the owner of some of these standards and um, even though that's our, sure. you know, that way, their intent is that's the way they do things every day. They still need someone who is sort of their true north to point out, hey, we're kind of losing discipline around standardized work because they're they're human, sure. they're a complex organization. These things happen. But I mean, that that yeah. that that's, that's, yeah. that seems like a if, uh, if people understand goal. what the term standard work means, then like, yeah, we we should have a standard work for innovation. And people find that like very counterintuitive, right? But there's a way to do innovation well, and there's a way to do it poorly, and every venture capitalist agrees. They don't necessarily agree on what the standard work should be, or even that um, it should be the same checklist you know, for every company. Mm-hmm. But you know, they know it when they see it. They know what good innovation looks like, yeah. and they know that there's a certain mindset and a certain culture and a certain way of going about things that works and ones that don't. So like, you know... And any company that's a corporate venture arm is already investing on that thesis already. So they already believe it. They just have mm-hmm. to admit it to themselves. Mm. Can you imagine if we had like um, a finance center <laughs> or a marketing center? You're like, yes, this organization does do finance. Absolutely. But only in this room <laughs> over here. And if you have any finance issues, go take them over there. They'll do them for you. And then yeah. it's like, what the hell are you talking about? Like finance implicates every single thing that we do in the organization and innovation is absolutely no different. Yeah. And I actually like because of my role in the ecosystem, I meet these innovation center directors all the time. Mm-hmm. I get the phone call. Okay, I'm the guy they call, and it's always like you know they're always eight. They always have an 18 month mandate from the CEO that they got this budget, and they're off. And like they're always nine months in when they call me for some mm-hmm. reason. Mm-hmm. And it's like so uh, hypothetically speaking, if I had a friend who was an innovation center <laughs> director and his teams were getting absolutely no results. <laughs> what would you recommend, right? Like, what? Mm. How do I talk to the CEO about that? Because if they, if you're not clear what the objectives are, you know, if you don't change people's mindset, if you don't train them in a new way of working, if the culture in the innovation center is the same, or mm-hmm. it's just like we throw beanbag chairs at the same old thing, if people's bonus system, if the incentive structures are the same, if the HR policies are the same. I mean, I was working with one innovation center where they couldn't even get permission to build the environment different. Like mm. They couldn't even get a physical plant to let them like have an open office space or anything. And it's like, they're getting the same results. So it's just doing the same old thing, but calling it innovation. It doesn't, it doesn't get you anywhere. And God forbid you have a success. This is the thing I never understand about the innovation center. What if the next Steve jobs happens to be working in the innovation center and they come out with the iPhone while they're sitting there? And they're like, listen, I've had a breakthrough discovery that's so radical. It means everything else we do as an organization is going to become obsolete. And we yeah. have to like, completely transform. Right? We, had, we had throw away the printing presses and become a digital newspaper. We have to just pick your favorite pivot moment from business history, right? We have to get out of the memory manufacturing business and the semiconductor manufacturing. Like it's something really dramatic that has to happen. What's the innovation center director supposed to do with this information? Like, does the company have a plan for like how do we create a new division? I mind my favorite question for CEOs: How do you create a new division of your company? They're like, uh, I just yeah. draw it on a, di- on a piece of paper and say, now we have a new division. Like, there's no pl- there's no process, and therefore there's no standard of work, and therefore there's nobody thinking about how to do it well. No one even knows if we did do it well. So yeah. we wouldn't accept this kind of loosey goosey lack of standard and accountability in any other kind of work that we do. Why why should innovation be a, be an exception? Yeah. Great, great question. And, you know, I feel like we, we've just scratched the surface. You know, I want to thank you for uh, taking time to talk today. I mean, there, there, there's, this makes me look uh, even uh, get, get me more excited about uh, Lean Startup Week. Um, I mean, I think, you know, within I, I've been, you know, uh, I find it really fascinating, the, the you know, just the, the 
intellectual stimula stimulation and the uh, the energy that's in the lean startup um, community, even though I feel like I'm just kind of on the edges of uh, that community, um, there's there's a lot of thought provoking stuff and a lot of great people. And I think for for those and lots of other reasons, I would encourage uh, people if they can uh, to go to Lean Startup Week. Um, can can you tell the listeners a little bit about um, Lean Startup Week and what what some of the plans are for this year? Sure. Oh yeah. Thank you. I mean, yeah, it is it is now a whole week long. Um, and, and we try really as much as possible to learn by doing. So we, we try to have kind of hands-on immersive experiences as well as just uh, uh, just people talking about it. Uh, so if you've never actually seen a Silicon Valley style startup up close and you'd like to like to see what it looks like, uh, we, you know, we do site visits and and uh, you can kind of, kind of see see the animal in its native habitat, as well as of course, talking all this theory about the, the things we have to learn between startup founders and, and uh, leaders in large companies. It's probably the only conference in the world that has such a um, like such an unusual combination of company sizes and industries to you know all mixed up together. You yeah. rarely see startup founders and CIOs in the same room, let alone uh, all kind of learning together. And of course, uh, you know we have tremendous speakers uh, and, and faculty like Mark who have uh, to help us um, bring these worlds together. I've always wanted one of my dreams has been to have people in the startup community play the red bead game. So I'm <laughs> yeah. uh, very excited. Very excited about that that for this year. And I guess the other thing I would say is this is not a conference full of speakers that you can hear anywhere else. We really try hard to get unheralded voices like right from the trenches mm -hmm. so that we can speak candidly about what's actually going on with these projects. So it's not a lot of rah-rah PR-driven announcements. It really is people who are willing to talk about the challenges uh, that they're facing right now. And therefore, it has a kind of a raw energy that that most business conferences just don't. Well, and I, I appreciate, you know, there's, there's so many reasons, um, uh, you know, it's, it's great that your, your team putting into the conference really does make an effort to, uh, to reach out, um, inviting people to submit applications to come, uh, tell their story. I, I you know, that, that leads to, uh, so many more diverse voices and, and perspectives, uh, part Absolutely. of the conference. And, and I think that makes for a stronger event. So I, I applaud what you and your team have done, um, in, in, in that way, um, and everything uh, else, you. putting together a, a great event. Yeah, I, I think I think people will have a good time, and I know you and I have have spoken before. That I, I forget now who somebody had a, had a had a blog post recently about the challenge of a kind of certain kind of lethargy and lack of energy that had sunk into the lean manufacturing movement, and, and the need to to kind of seek out new voices and new sources of energy. And I was like, hey, over here, <laughs> look over here, we, we got yeah. something pretty exciting going on here, and it's. I don't mean that in a boastful way. I mean, like, no, it's true. This is, I really view us as a, you know, as not really distinct communities. I mean, we, we share an intellectual foundation and it was a real opportunity to learn from each other. So if we can be a source of energy and excitement, mm -hmm. if, if you want to talk to people who think lean is just, um, you know, a new, fresh, bold thing that, that is cutting edge, um, come, come meet yeah. our folks there. Uh, they're pretty excited to be there. Yeah. Well, and and there, there's there's uh, I think you know just serendipity. Um, just think of you know, remind a story real quick of it was during one of the networking sessions. I met a woman whose background was social work, who was doing a startup, um, kind of a nonprofit startup in that area. And we were talking, and she suggested, uh, "Oh, I bet you'd be interested in something called motivational interviewing." And uh, this is a methodology um, that. Uh, it was had its roots in of all places uh, addiction counseling addiction therapy and uh, you know kind of reading about this and seeing connections to the workplace I you know I've discovered recently people at guess what Toyota have been teaching this methodology to their managers for the last twenty years and there's a former Toyota uh, manager who's out there teaching this to other organizations I'm expecting we've been talking about getting him on the podcast soon but. Just being there, the serendipity of being at the event, a random conversation with somebody um, opened my eyes to uh, a, a different exciting frontier around um, understanding people, managing change. So that's, I think. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, the unexpected collisions and kind of different worlds colliding, I just think that that is it's both really fun and provides a lot of intellectual stimulation. And, uh, you know, and, and I know you and I both believe hearing from more diverse voices, you know, mm -hmm. leads to a more creative outcome overall. So we're really proud of that aspect as well. Yeah. So I encourage people to go to leanstartup.co. And uh, again, you know, Eric's new book, The Startup Way, October 17th, I believe is the uh, release date. You can pre-order yes, that. Sir. 
Sometimes books sneak out a day or two early through the Amazon supply chain. <laughs> so again, the new book, The Startup Way, and our, our guest today, again, has been Eric Reese. Eric, thank you so much for um, talking with us today. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for listening. This has been the Lean Blog Podcast. For lean news and commentary updated daily, visit www.leanblog.org. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, email mark at leanpodcast at gmail.com.